Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director for the Center of the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, at Wayne State University. Uh, we're here today on uh, fe February 26th for another version of Meet the Methodologist, and it's our pleasure to be chatting with Steve Brigatti from the University of Kentucky. And Steve is here to give a webcast lecture today on network analysis, uh, and this is our chance to chat with him and learn about his views on some different uh, professional and career related issues. So Steve, welcome to Wayne State, and welcome Excellent. back to Carmen. Glad to be here. So, uh, I usually begin, Steve, with the question of how you got interested in research methods and social network analysis, uh, which as I mentioned uh, is the topic of your webcast later today. I guess the sociological answer is that I went to UC Irvine and at that time everybody was doing research methods and network analysis and I just kind of got sucked into it. Uh -huh. um, I suppose more psychologically, I like things in which you build a tool that can be used and reused for lots of different things. So you can find out one specific thing about something or you can find out a general way of finding out about those kinds of things and I just gravitate towards that. Uh -huh. And while you were at Irvine, did you have a favorite research methods or social network class uh, that you took that kind of uh, stimulated and uh, stimulated? If you, if so, why that particular one? Well, it's funny. When I was there, uh, there were no required classes except for one. You had to show up for colloquium, so I didn't take a lot of classes. Mm -hmm. But what really stood out was I took. Uh, this guy named Bob Newcomb who teaches stats, and uh, I took his undergraduate class when I was a PhD student because I'd had no stats, and I absolutely loved it. This is a guy who really knew how to teach stuff and not cover the material, but try to explain the feel of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then I took his multivariate classes, and that really hooked me on a certain way of thinking about problems. Yeah. And as you were taking those classes, uh, were there any particular challenges that you faced uh, in learning uh, that material as a graduate student? Yeah, when you're as smart as I am. As <laughs> as as. Um, no, uh, you know, research methods always came much more naturally to me than anything else. So I could take a theory course and go in one ear and out the other. But somehow research methods, I not only, I think once I understood it, there was no way of ever forgetting it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like... Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, advanced stats I never took. I never took mathematical statistics and things like that. I wish I had. Um, and I think now it's a bit challenging to go learn them. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of the stuff that people are doing today, methods-wise, just didn't exist then or were just not popular. And I, I'm always wanting to, to go learn about negative binomial regressions and Poisson regressions and you know all these things that are, that are out there, and I never quite get around to it. Um, so I think it would be quite challenging now. Yeah. Well, we would uh, certainly welcome you to come to any of our short courses on those I'll do particular it. I'll topics. Do it. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously you've, uh, you've uh, come a great distance since your time at Irvine, and you have a lot of experience as a reviewer for substantive papers that use social network analysis. And I was wondering whether you could comment on what you see as some of the most frequent limitations or shortcomings of the papers uh, that you, re you review, uh, both in terms of the theory and, and research methods and even the underlying uh, substantive aspects of it. Well, that really um, brings out the, uh, <laughs> I don't know, there's certain uh, pet peeves I have. Uh, one thing I see a lot as an editor for OrgSci is a lot of network papers these days seem to have a complete divorce between the methods and the theory. Um, the methods seem to be, people don't seem to understand that the methods embody some kind of a theory, and so you can't just match them up to any old theory sort of willy-nilly. I mean, I actually see that in many papers people are justifying the choice of, say, between the centrality is what they're studying, uh, because so-and-so Powell did it or somebody else did it in some other famous paper which is just, it just completely misses the point, not realizing that the mechanism that makes betweenness sensible in one paper doesn't make it uh, appropriate for the kind of thing that they're studying. Mm -hmm. So I see that kind of uh, stuff a lot. I see a lot of cookie cutter studies these days. Um, there's something like 60 something papers on structural holes and performance. How can we need that many studies of that? Um, so I don't think this is unique to network analysis. I think it's something that's happening in the field in general um, in terms of uh, scholarship and people understanding what the real point of research is. 
Uh, do you have a current favorite, uh, or do you have a favorite research methods book that either influenced you greatly or upon which you rely regularly these days? Well, I don't. I mean, uh, I think that uh, the book that most influenced me, and I can't even remember what it was called. It's probably called Statistics, and I think it was Pisani and Purvis and several other authors. And it's one of these books that, again, tries to explain the actual logic of things rather than focusing on the formulas. And I remember it's very distinctive because they try to make it look friendly by using a handwritten font to make all the figures, and they kind of draw these scatter plots that are, um, you know, look like they're hand drawn. Very, very effective. And, mm -hmm. and and when you read that book, you find out you learn to be able to look at a scatter plot and say, you know, that's a correlation of about 0.6. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you don't, if you take a traditional uh, course, you just don't get that kind of feeling. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, well, you have uh, considerable experience uh, as an author, as an editor, uh, and as a teacher, and I'm wondering if from a big picture kind of perspective, are there topical areas within the fields of research methods and specifically social network analysis that you think that we're doing a particularly good job of investigating and advancing our understanding of the method, or are there areas where uh, people are missing the boat? Hmm. That's a much harder question. Um, you know, the energy right now in social network analysis is understanding network change, which is what my webcast is going to be about. And so there's a lot of um, nice developments there, and that's part of a larger movement, which is to make network analysis more stochastically oriented, building models of how networks change, and uh, as opposed to what mostly has been done, and mostly what I do, which is more deterministic, more mathematical as opposed to statistical approaches. So I think that's something that's, that's really moving forward right now. Um, as for things that, uh, that we're not doing so well, um, I don't, I, I think that we're doing pretty well in a lot of things. I, I suppose uh, one other area that's a little bit weak but is also changing a lot is in looking at the s relationship between social network kinds of things and psychological kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The field is kind of founded on as a, an allergic reaction to psychology. Um, the idea was to look at things on a purely sort of structural basis. But now the time has come to that we have to bring in a little bit more of the psychology. Mm -hmm. And I think that is happening. Yeah. Um, so you work a lot uh, with doctoral students. And uh, given your success as a scholar, uh, what type of advice do you have for the doctoral students who want to pursue a career as a researcher? What can they do uh, that you think will help them enhance their opportunities for success? Get out. Get out now. <laughs> Get out while you can, huh? Um, you know, that's a tough one for me because I, I sometimes feel like I give advice that, uh, to students that is actually harmful to them <laughs> in the sense that I'm an old line kind of positivist scientist type and that's not really where the field is at and so I encourage them to spend a lot more time on mechanism and not on so much on things like knowing what the right reference is and so on. I'm not sure that that's the best professional advice for them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I stick to my guns, I one thing that I really think that we should be teaching our graduate students is computer programming skills. Not only does it let you manipulate your data in ways that you just can't do in SAS or whatever, um, but it teaches you a way of thinking about data that is very powerful and a way of understanding things. So once you've programmed, for example, factor analysis or you've programmed uh, multiple regression by hand yourself, you understand the choices that have been made in making those mm -hmm. techniques and what alternatives could be. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the topic of your webcast today, and I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about the origins of it, uh, where the ideas came from, and give just a quick summary of it. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, actually, I, I deliberately chose it as something that I have not been studying, just to provide an impetus to, to, to go work on it. Um, as I said before, there's a lot of uh, study of change of networks these days. And um, in particular, there, there's very interesting models that have been developed in the Netherlands by Tom Schneiders. What I thought I would do today is present something that's much simpler, because the trouble with those really complex models is that most people can't in understand them. They mm -hmm. are really require some study to, to get to. So um, this is meant as a kind of a simple alternative for really describing change in a network. Uh, and there is just not that much of it out there. Uh, people often ask in taking introductory social network workshops and things, 
uh, how do we handle network change? And the answers are in many ways obvious, but uh, for some reason, unless there's a button on the computer program or something that says that, that they don't see how it's connected to an investigation of change. Mm -hmm. So my objective today is really just to show many things that can be done. They're kind of commonsensical, but just actually take the step of applying them to network change. Okay. Uh, I like uh, to close with a couple of more personal questions. And I was wondering, do you do anything special that, that uh, to inspire you or to draw motivation for your work? Hmm. Um, no, I have uh, no, uh, my problem is lack of time. I think up stuff all the time. My problem is I can never get stuff done um, and finished up. Mm -hmm. So I start new projects. Uh, you know, I think part of it, I was talking about programming earlier. I continue to program, and as I do, I just think up new new ways of doing things all the time. Mm. It's just uh, falls straight out of that that way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. And what mm. do you uh, like the least, and what do you like most about uh, the work that you do, the various roles that you're in, and the various uh, tasks and activities that you perform? Hmm. Um, well, what I like the most, this is this is has to do with just being a professor in general. Uh, I like my own, managing my own time. Mm -hmm. That is crucial for me. I like the least whenever somebody imposes uh, time constraints on me. So meetings, travel, uh, faculty meetings, um, things like that, uh, I, I really can't stand. I also, you know, I feel um, that universities don't do a particularly good job these days um, of insulating professors from administration. I think the, the, the objective of administration should be to give faculty the illusion that all they have to do is think in order to do their job. They just have to think stuff and, and, and that will um, lead to these publications and so on. And everything else needs to just be taken care of around them without them being able to see it. What I actually experience is that I, I have to spend a lot of my time thinking about things that actually somebody else would be do a better job of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we do appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule and uh, making a return trip to Karma. Steve's a former short course instructor for us. Uh, we thank you for sharing your thoughts and we look forward to your webcast. Great. Thanks, Larry. Yep.